Welcome back to our latest edition of Talk with Traders. Today, I'm fortunate to have with me Mr. Stephen Goldstein. Stephen is a 20-year veteran of the financial services industry as a professional investment bank trader before turning uh, to executive coaching and founding Alpha R Cubed, which is a world-renowned high-performance coaching firm focused on improving the vital human behavior aspects of working in the financial markets and financial market performance and working with traders and executives. Our discussion centers around how to improve your performance by not just focusing on the behaviors that you may uh, exhibit themselves, but how to dig deeper and understand the root causes of those behaviors and address them. Let's get to the interview. And Stephen, I appreciate you do taking the time to, to talk with us because uh, you've been very generous. You did a great um, a session with us actually uh, a month ago or so now, yeah. and uh, and I actually learned a lot from that. And I'm, I'm very happy at the opportunity to, to be able to talk with you again. Um, one of the things that you had talked about actually a lot in in um, in that and uh, with Alpha R Cubed um, is the um, behaviors and how we how we need to not un only understand our behaviors but dig a little deeper and I wanted to talk to you today about that because I find that fascinating because we talk a lot about you know I I'm trading bad today or I'm an over trader or I'm an under trader and I, I get questions all the time about so how do I fix that? And I always find that a tough question because I don't, I don't know what's causing that. So I'm not sure how to help. And in fact, you know, with myself, I get the same thing. Hey, today I'm, I'm not, I'm not trading well. And, and I sit back and say, okay, so what do I need to do about that? And, uh, and it's not always an easy answer. So I'd be curious to hear, you know, your, your experience and your opinion on, you know, when, I, when I'm sitting here and I'm having a good day or a bad day, if I feel that uh, there's something I need to address, sometimes it's not the obvious thing that I should be tackling. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I guess you're, you're talking about how I see it. It's a lot of these behaviors, a lot of these things we, we notice and see and experience on a daily basis. People think they are of, that is often the problem. But those are really symptoms. The symptoms of something far deeper. And you know, as with any illness, if you try and fix the system, the symptom rather, if you try and fix the symptom, you don't cure it. You know, you, 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 you maybe address it for a little bit and then something else pops up and it comes back again. And it, in fact, if anything, you can actually reinforce the problem that's leading to the symptom mm. by trying to do that. Um, so yeah, you're you're right. The way you've you, you've you've sort of mentioned that that there's something deeper going on, um, and, and usually you have to look into where where is that coming from. It's it's very hard to do yourself. Hmm. You know, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, it's incredibly difficult to do. Um, and I, I can share some of my own experiences trying to do that with myself as a trader. Sure. Um, that, that sheds a light on that. So I, I was a trader for, I mean, I'm now a coach, but I was a trader for, from 1986 up until 2010. Okay. That was my full-time professional job. And I worked for investment banks um, over here in London. And um, I, you know, I, I, I had a good career, especially, you know, I, I moved up quite quickly in my early career. And as you move up, you get more exposure, you, you know, you, you, you do more, you're, you're, you're giving more risks to run. But uh, as you're doing it, you become more aware of some of your problems. Everyone has them. No, no one is perfect. Right. Uh, we have these challenges. And I was always trying to think, how do I make myself better? Right. You know, I know there's areas to improve. I know there's behaviors which keep cropping up in my process. Um, and I want to get better at that. And I read every book that you could possibly read, you know, the Market Wizards books, my favorites, reminiscences. Yeah. I've read them over and over again. And I learned a lot about these things, but I probably learned was that other people have it as well. 
Right. You know, that, that's not really giving a cue. I would make notes. Yeah, I've got to do what he did. I've got to do what that person's done. So I would make notes. But of course, I wasn't really. What I was trying to do was fix, fix the symptom. Right. You know, or recognize the symptom. And nothing was changing. I noticed that because, you know, let's say I would read the first market visits book every three years. And I noticed me always agreeing with what they've written. And then finally on the next page that I've made a note, we left a yellow post-it note there, which refers to that issue. It's the same issue coming up again with me. So I'm not, I'm not fixing it. I'm just, I'm just noticing it. And I, I went through this, this problem pretty much for about 13, 14 years. And then for the first time in my life, I managed to get a steer on it because I started working with a coach. Now, that, that coach wasn't specifically for trading. I was working at a, a German bank in London and they gave me an executive coach. Okay. That coach, I mean, he did work in the financial markets uh, with a lot of traders, but his background wasn't trading and it wasn't specifically focused on trading. But I started to understand myself going through that process. You know, I, I learned more in, I think I had 12 hours of coaching sessions with him over about six months. And I probably learned more in that sort of hours than I had in the previous um, hmm. 14 years. Wow. Reading, trying to look at who I was. Because it's a process of self-reflection. Um, they'll use tools and methods which get you to see yourself. Uh, and you start asking questions about yourself. And the coach challenges you. And I started to become a lot more aware of who I was and how it was. It started a journey for me yeah. that I was then able to continue after that process. It catalyzed something for me. Right. And I became a far more self-aware trader and I started trying to address some of these deeper issues. I started trying to attack them. I started, you know, trying to get to the nub of the issues. That's hard to do on your own, but I was doing it and I was using processes and methods which helped me do that. Um, and my performance started to improve, you know, it was results were more consistent, results were better, more consistent. Um, you know, I'm still suffering the problems that every trader suffers because you do, it's the nature of this business. You know, it's it's like if you watch a great, great athlete, every now and then they'll do something which, you know, an error that a schoolboy would have done. Yeah. Um, you, know, you, you never get over that. You can't be perfect. Right. But they become less, and they become less damaging and less challenging. So it's almost like you've got to try and think what is behind it. What is the next level? The next level like that. In, in other words, if you think of the symptoms like you see the leaves on a tree, you know the health of the tree. You might see is from what's going on in the ground, in the roots, in the root system. Of the tree. So. Uh, what would you consider the, the symptom or those outward behaviors? Uh, is it the stuff I was talking about, like, you know, you know over trading or under trading or, you know, failing to meet your stops or is it something different? What, let's start there. But it, 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 there's, there's quite a few things. The one thing we might be talking about is misalignment, misalignment mm -hmm. process okay. with your own personality or, you know, you might be using a system that wasn't designed for you or made for you. We, we see that a lot. So, for example, you learn from somebody else. Right. Now, and we're, we're all different, we're all as unique as, you know, our DNA and our fingerprint. And everyone's method and approach and style hmm. is, is slightly unique to them. Yeah, you know, we, we had a, a conversation in our trade room yesterday where uh, two of our traders who uh, sort of they said they grew up together. Now, this is a retail world, so it's different because you're not given a fixed system that you have to work into, right? Which is one of those big differences when you, in an investment bank, of course, you generally get, you know, there's a system and usually they want you to sort of trade within uh, and those those parameters. Nowadays, I understand they're, they're broadening those, but from a retail perspective, you sort of have to make it up for yourself but their point was that they they had actually traded together especially in very early days for them and had learned you know the sort of the same principles but they found today they traded very very differently and I use the analogy to say well to me that's a healthy sign because hopefully they're, they've developed a system that works a little bit better for them personally sort of the way you know you can have children that grow up and you know siblings 
same parents, same household, and yet can be radically different in their personalities, in their outlook on life, and their perspectives. And I find that trading is a lot the same way. We might be given all the same tools, but your trading style and strategy, you really do have to customize it to yourself. Because as you point out, um, uh, you know, like everybody's different and it's got to fit with your, your, I don't know, your, your outlook, your temperament. Um, you know, I've said for, for a long time, uh, Andrew Aziz, who founded Bearable Traders, I watched him and I desperately wanted to be like him because I watched what he did. I thought it was fascinating. I wanted to do that. But he is a very intuitive trader. He's great at the momentum. He trades the open in the morning when everything is chaotic. And I realized... I, I couldn't do it. I just, I can't trade like that. As much as I wanted to, I'm not capable of it. So I had to develop a different strategy, which is a little more pedantic. It gives me time to look at longer uh, setups, you know, because, uh, you know, apparently my personality is one where I'm just not good in that, you know, quick decision making. Apparently that's not me. Yeah, but it's, it, you know, it's, I, I talk about personality a lot, and, and when I work with people, I analyze their personality using various tools. And if, you, if you're not working in a way that's aligned with your personality, then you're fighting yourself. Right. You know, it's hard enough to fight in the market. So. And most of us, most of us figure this out through trial and error. How do we, how do we get past that? Like, how do you know if a system is not uh, good for you, or, or if you know if your behaviors are exposing an underlying issue? As you said, it's hard to figure that out on your own. If I'm out there trading, you know, from home or, or you know, on my own, how do I possibly? figure out where the root of some of those issues may be. This, I mean, this, this is a challenge because it, it takes time, it takes experience. You know, it's, it, it, it's a little bit like, you know, you sit down together, some of you, you're all showing the same system. And you assume that the guy who, or, 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 or the, uh, the woman who best trades that is the best trader. That's not true. They're the one who's best suited to that system or method. Okay. Um, and the other nine may, at that point, decide, I'm not going to trade, it's not worth it, I'm no good at this. <laughs> and uh, they check down. And that's, that's a shame, really, because they may be really good traders. Right. They've just been shown the wrong system and approach right. to stop with. So, you know, we, we go down with this problem at the very beginning. Am I using a system, a method that suited to me? We don't even think that when we start. Right. You know, we, we, we think. When we start trading and we look, we go, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm talking up from retail trading experience, not my own, but uh, and many people I've spoken to, that you, you, you find something and you start learning it. Like you learn to trade that way. Right. And you assume that is how you trade. Mm. And what I find is that when I start working with people, you know, particularly when I work with retail traders, they're not trading in a way that's optimal for them. Right. You know, it might be optimal for someone else. Hmm. You know, but it might have come to somebody else. Right. You know, and to me, I always use the example of it's like, it's like wearing somebody else's suit. It doesn't fit you well. It was cut for that person and they're handing it for you. And if, even if you're quite similar to them, it's never going to fit you in the same way. Right. And from that will come frustration, anger, fear. Like you say, you may check out of the job, because you think you're just not made for this. Right. But it's not true, it's just you're not made for that style. And it's not just personality, it's, it's things like risk philosophy as well. You have to align your personality, your risk philosophy, and your approach. And those three must be aligned. Hmm. And when that happens, you'll start finding better results, and you'll start being more confident, and you'll start behaving better, and you'll start doing less of the things that really annoy you. I mean, if you find a method that suits you and you were comfortable with, you may find you overtrade a lot less. Hmm. You, you, or you may find that you you're better at taking the risk. You can you can sit with risk longer. Right. It fits you and you get why you're doing it this way. Right. So you might 
these different parts might change. Yeah. So it sounds like, uh, you know, maybe one of the best approaches people should be trying different systems, even if you don't, you know, maybe you don't think it's for you, but you, you, you should maybe give it a shot and, and sort of, like you said, maybe try on different suits <laughs> to see which ones fit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, there is there is that, but the, it's not just that. I mean, it's one thing. Okay. You know, like you say with these guys, you know, they, they seem to have adapted it and shaped it and molded it. Right. And I, I see that happen a lot as well, you know, where people do start learning the same system, but then they start to, I mean, I've seen it with one prop shop here in London right. that I worked with where they were all mentored by the same guy who all taught them the same thing. And now they're all trading in different ways mm. that, that capture the best parts of their personality. Right. And where they can leverage their strengths most effectively. So you can see the DNA of the original trading system that they right. learned, or trading method they learned in their workbook. But they've all nuanced it and continued to fold out. So it's some of the methods and approaches are actually very different now. You wouldn't even say they're the same system. Yeah. You know, so it's shaping around. It's also important to have the right philosophy to understand, you know, we had a little chat before we started about understanding the nature of how financial markets are. We talked about the nature of uncertainty right. and the nature of systems. A lot of people come into trading with the wrong understanding of what trading is. You know, one thing is they think you learn it and then you're a trader and you're going to make money doing it, which is certainly not true. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I, I always say that's like coming into boxing and learning to box and thinking you're a boxer. You're not, you're just somebody's learned to box. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got another five, six years before you start being yourself a boxer. Um, and then you've got, you know, understanding the nature of how financial markets work and what they are, right. you know, and adjusting yourself to that and acclimatizing to that. You know, there, there is this kind of belief, I think, which is, uh, you know, the financial markets are certain, they work in certain ways. If you do A, B and C, then D is going to happen. There's some sort of system. And they don't, they are so uncertain, they are so complex, they have so many variables. You have to go out there and think there is no right answer. Huh. Well, there is, is, you know, it, 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 this can throw you off any day and I think we've been really understanding that in 2020 and what the new people are, you know, and, and the system you've learned might not work in that environment. Right. When the environment changes, it may have been made for a, a more stable environment or just a, a, a bullish environment. Yeah. Trending environment. And, and you know, it, it, one of the problems that people have as well is they will often take their first experiences in their first couple of years and that becomes the view of the world that they see. So, you know, if you, if you trade in through a relatively quiet period in your early years, you think that's how it is, you kind of, you know, you project forward, that's how it's always going to be and I'm always going to yeah. deal within that. On the other hand, if you started trading in the 1st of January 2020, you're going to form a very different view of how markets are right. and how markets work. Yeah. And, you know, that you might start trading in a way that's suited to great volatility. And, and you might do pretty well at the start, but then when that volatility dies down, well, and we, we, we move back into a trending market, you might find yourself really struggling. Yeah. So there's so different aspects. That's a that's a great point. And this is a recent conversation we had as well about this, where uh, you know, I had a trader ask me, "Is this a good market to learn to trade in?" And I said, "Look, I don't, I honestly don't believe it's better or worse than any other market. What you have to acknowledge is the nature of the market is always changing. There's seasonal differences, as you point out. There's differences by year, and and but it's always subtly changing. And you're right. Like you may learn right now a system that works great when you've got volatile markets and you never know if it's going to open high or lower and and you may develop something that works but you just have to your, your best the best advice i can give someone is you know learn, learn to trade whenever you're ready to learn but just acknowledge that what you're learning today there will be skills that will be applicable but the market itself that nature is changing and as long as you're adaptable to that or at least aware of the change you can hopefully then adapt to it you know because i was thinking the other day um you know as we come into this significant downturn there are traders, even professional traders out there who have spent their entire career 
in a bull market. Like we've had the longest running bull market in history. There are people that are just, hey, the market's going to eventually go up. It, it, it's always gone up. Because, and it's a legitimate perspective. If you've been trading for 10 years, you think, look, I'm a 10 year veteran. The market always goes up because in the last 10 years, essentially it has. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, it, it's sort of you, you become baptized by the market environment that you, you're born into. Right. And that, that shapes your view of the world right. and how you do it. I, mean, I, I, I always made this point, I didn't realize it 10 many years later. Although I started on this trading desk in 1986, um, I wasn't given my first book till October 1987. Okay. And that was one ahead of time to try and start trading. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I wasn't trading stocks, I was trading, you know, sort of rates and FX. But they were all. Um, they were they were all impacted, you know, by the events of October '87. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and that, that shook you up. I was trading stocks privately for myself, um, and, and that was like, you know, that was like being born in the middle of a war, literally <laughs> on a war zone. And, and that shaped the way I looked at markets right. for many many years. And you know, I, I don't think it's any surprise or shock that my best years have come during fine and bear markets. You know, because I was geared to that, and the years I struggled were quiet years that uh, were just trended slowly, and right. there wasn't very much volatility. And I would do well when there was a break of volatility. I was only later in my life that I, I realised that, yeah, you know I've got to learn to trade during relatively calm bull markets and you know uh, trending markets. Right. Otherwise, you know. These don't come along. We talk about volatility. Yeah, yeah. You know, they come along every five to ten years, you know, which means that you give an awful lot back in between. Right. So, so these days are well suited to you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I've not been really trading. I mean, I've got a few positions, but my, my professional trading days yeah. behind me, sure. I still call myself an amateur yeah. trader. Right. Uh, and yeah, it's, it, it's been pretty good, but. It's not, I suppose it's something I'm used to, you know, I mean, I, I struggled over the last few years with my amateur trading because there just weren't many of these sort of periods. Wow. To me, Stephen, there's a lesson in that right there. If after, you know, your years of experience, you still consider yourself an amateur trader 34 years later, <laughs> we should all take note of that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm by amateurs. I'm not trading for a living. I, I understood. <laughs> but even, yeah, it's a bit of a hobby, but you do, you, you, when you do it like a hobby, when you're not as engaged with it, one of the reasons yeah. I, I made that choice is it, it wasn't a deliberate choice. I decided to go into this, this world and I'm coaching right. uh, traders and my, my plan originally was I'm going to do that and I'm going to professionally train for myself. I had my right. and, um, and as I got busier and busier with this, I found it very difficult because I, I'm a quite intense trader. I like to be at the screens. Right. I like to follow the market closely. Um, I like to be able to do my homework. And I, I found that I wasn't getting the time for that, which meant that the only way I could trade was kind of from a distance. And that didn't really suit me. Yeah. I kind of thought, well, I'm going to forget that. It's not my, you know, my, my, my income early in my living now is going to come from coaching people. Um, and that's what I want my profession to be. So in a sense, I retired from trading. But you keep your hand in, you can't stop yourself. You know, it's run bunch of audience to it, you love it. So I do it as a hobby on the side now. But right. I never talk about it because, you know, it's, I'm not one to talk about my positions or my risk because, you know, I've always been like that. It, sure. I, I would never stare at anyway. Right. Well, we're, we're, we are glad that you decided to go into coaching because uh, <laughs> you're... Uh, you certainly provide a lot of insight to us. You touched on something I wanted to come back to because you touched about risk and and how risk needs to be as personal as your trading system. Because to me, you know that that's part of uh, if I'm looking at a system overall, a strategy. It's not just whatever patterns you're trading. It's how you're managing risk, how you've decided what risk to undertake, and. Um, 
you know, it, it, again, in, in, in talking with a lot of the traders with whom I have the opportunity to interact with, some have said, hey, look, I get nervous when I take more than, let's just use an arbitrary number, more than $100 risk on a trade because um, it's my money and I can't do that. Whereas I've had other people say, well, if I'm not risking at least $100, I don't take it seriously and, and I'm, not, I'm not trading properly. Um, you know, it, it, to me, that's one of those perhaps behaviors or symptoms you have to know about for yourself such that you can incorporate it into your strategy. Do you encounter that as well, that people have just very different perspectives as to what risk means to them and therefore different ways they have to manage that? Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, this, this is one of my biggest problems I find with, with many traders is all the effort goes into the system and the analysis, mm. you know, and that's, that's the key to the door, right? Once you open the door, it's all about risk management then, and how you take risk and how you manage risk. And actually, if you think about it, we might put 95% of our effort into the analysis, right. and 5% of our effort into developing our risk skills. Because your risk skills are more important than the analysis, right. if I'm honest. You know, that, that is where, you know, your job is to monetize risk, to monetize value. So you find the value, but the real skill is in how you monetize that. Hmm. And, 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 you know, I, I, I talked about this, this journey that I was on uh, when I was a trader, I was a trader for many years, I then had a coach after 13 years. And then that journey completely changed for me. Right. And that coaching catalyzed a lot for me. One of the things I got from that, and what, one of the experiments we went through was some personality analysis. And some of the feedback I got from that was, do you know what, Steve, you're very analytical. That's what I'm finding. Right. I'm surprised you were, he kind of said to me, I'm surprised you're a trader. Now, you know, bear in mind he wasn't a trader himself. So he didn't quite understand what, you know, what was involved. But he just thought a risk taker, a trader is a risk taker, a risk taker is a guy who's, you know, is willing to jump on a motorbike and put a foot to the floor and fall down the streets at 150 miles an hour, right? Right, right. Which, which I can tell you, there's, you know, there's not many risk takers like that that I've ever come across. Uh, right. You know, even the more ballsy ones aren't, you know, you would never describe like that. Um, but it made me think, yeah, I am very analytical. And I came out of that and I started looking at my processes, what I do and the way I do it. And I thought, yeah, do you know what? My analysis has always been my strong point. It's always been a great way of finding value. But actually, I'm so poor at monetizing that value. Mm. You know, yeah, I've done well enough. You know, I've stayed in this job for many years, had some really good years, had some not so good years. Um, it's been, uh, you know, it, it's, it's always been a journey. But I was like, well, let's rank myself out of 10 here as an analyst. Probably eight easily, possibly nine out of 10. I, you know, I've been doing it enough years to know that. But let's rank myself as a, as a taker and manager of risk. And I gave myself a ranking of about two, maybe three out of ten. Wow. And I thought, you know, that's not very good. I've right. got to work on that. I've got to develop that side of me. And that became my project, that project me, to improve how I was as a risk taker. Right. To make that better, to improve my philosophy um, around risk, because that, your philosophy affects how you take risk and how you manage risk and the processes and approach and systems and methods you use. Right. So I, I kind of went through this kind of almost a rebirth. And uh, I would say by the end of it, or certainly, you know, during that process, I got myself out to, I would rank myself five or six out of 10 as a risk taker on some days or weeks, even seven or eight. And I saw the difference in my p and and the consistency. Um, you know, how much more comfortable I was taking risk. And, and here I was doing something which was quite unique. And I kind of separated myself out now. I said, I'm going to have two hats. I'm going to have my analyst hat and I'm going to have my risk taking hat. Huh. You know? So it was really being very deliberate about understanding that risk process. And when, when you start trading, no one will teach you that. Right. 
you know, no one says to you about that. They'll show you the system, they'll show you a method, they'll show you how to use charts, how to analyze. No one teaches you about risk, you know, how to manage risk, how to develop your risk skills, how to improve how you are at risk. You know, and, and that's why the, most of us are so poor. Right. You know, I, I'm not just talking about, you know, I, I work with some risk managers in hedge funds that run, uh, yeah, in some cases, half a billion dollars. Right. And even they are compromised on their risk skills. Hmm. You know, they're better than many, but there's still a huge gap. I, I do ask you this question. You know, let's look at your process, let's break it down. You know, where are you strong? Where are you weak? Right. What skills aren't you using? What strengths aren't you using? Um, and yeah, like I say, these are guys that come to me, they're making decent return every year, decent money. But they say, you know what, I'm leaving a lot of money on the table, and I know I am. And that's really frustrating and annoying for me. Right. You know, that's the gap I need to close and work on. And in your case, how did you... It's one thing to be aware of it. You know, you ranked yourself a two. You were pretty harsh, and you said you wanted to get better. You, you, you know, you, you worked on it. But how, how did you work on it? What specifically did you do to manage to get yourself up the scale? You know, to be a better risk manager. Yeah. Well, one of the things is I started journaling very actively. Okay. Um, it, it was my third attempt to start. I always call journaling the going to the gym of training. <laughs> you know, you're going to do it. Yes, I know it's going to be. <laughs> You know, I'll do it, I'm definitely going to get, I'll get a book, I'm going to start writing notes, I'm going to do this every day, and after two weeks to one month, you know, it's, like most of my gym efforts, it's gone. Yeah. You know, yeah. I get, I get there once a month, yeah. but then by the halfway through the year, you know, I paid that huge membership fee, and yeah, it's, it's gone now, it's, you know, and, and that is what journaling is. Yeah. If you think about the gym, you know, if you think about professional athletes, you know, they do the hard yards. Right. That's what they do. I, you know? I'm glad to hear you say that, Steve. I say that all the time, right? The the amount of time there's we always say there's no um, uh, there's no substitute for screen time. You've got to be there. You've got to be in front of the markets. You got and that's the live stuff. But yeah. there's a lot of work that goes to get to the point where you're on the field. I use the athlete analogy all the time, right? The time you see an athlete on the field is the minority of the time they spend. The rest of it is you know video review. It's like you said in the gym. It's lifting weights. It's practicing skills over and over again that's the stuff that we also have to do as a trader that you're right it's not sexy it's not glamorous often it sucks I tell people journal 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 because you, you know and I said the days you least want to journal are probably the days you most need to journal <laughs> yeah absolutely I mean I, I, I do say don't make the journal something that becomes tiresome you have to right. you know I, I, I like the idea of keeping a decision-making journal rather than just a journal where everything you do. Oh, I like that idea. Yeah. It's, it, it's zooming in because at the end of the day, this is all about your decision making. Right. You know, and that's what you need to improve. You know, it's not just about, you know, everything that you've done during the day. So you can keep the journal, and some people might want two journals, one for decision making, one to track what they're doing. But yeah, that's, that's one of the things is you can give, give the journal a go, why am I doing this? You know, what is the point of this? You know, if I go to the gym, why am I going to the gym? Is it I want to learn to run a marathon? Is it I want to, you know, I want to build my muscles and start creating an Adonis's body? You know, a lot of people just start journaling without a real purpose or idea what it's about. And journaling is an art. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you have to review it as well. There's no point just writing a journal. <laughs> if you're not going to look back and review it. Right. You know, it, it, it could be useful and, and some people quite enjoy that process. But it's got to have a purpose, it's got to have a goal, and it's got to have a purpose. Right. And, and the other side of it is when you talk about this non-sexy side of training. So one of the guys I coach, um, and this guy is the, the most brilliant trader, he's a private trader, um, he's a sniper, you call him a sniper. Okay. As a trader, a classic sniper trader. Right. Um, he's only a young guy, only 30, and he's, you know, he clears seven figures every year, so that's seven figures a third. Yeah. You know, and, and he started to be nothing, not that many years back, maybe 10 years ago. And the guy is brilliant, he's a genius, and I love, I love meeting him and talking about trading with him. Um, and he doesn't, you know, most people think because he's a day trader, as a sniper, he's going to trade every single day. Right. He doesn't. 
He has many days. He can even go weeks without training. Hmm. And that's a classic spike. Wow, yeah. You know, if you can't get out, you're not going to take the shot. Yeah. You know? And when he does take the shot, the shot might uh, There was one year, I think, he told me he traded on about 40-odd days a year. And it was his best ever year. Wow. You know? But he was in every single day. But the, the other point is, he doesn't get into about 9 o'clock in the office. Okay. And, and some of the things, because I interview other people to get guidance on, on a person so I could get I could get an objective view if they're not just a person's own view. And they you know, there was a sense from him that, you know, he's strolls in at nine o'clock, we don't know how he does it. He makes do his money, you know, he, he's he's you know, he always got his way back attitude to life, you know. Right. And it really sort of oh funny I could be like that guy strolling in at nine o'clock, yeah. make a load of money and then walk off. And, but they don't realise because he tells me he says those guys think I'll just show in at half eight nine o'clock so I'm up at five o'clock every single morning doing three hours of prep for that day right you know and I'll do the same when I get home in the evening they don't see that and that, that, and that is so you know so many of the great traders do that yeah. I remember hearing um, uh, an interview with uh, do you ever listen to Chat with Traders the podcast Yes, I have in the past, yeah. Yeah, okay, so it's a, it's a great podcast series, and there's a, an interview on there with a guy called, he's very well known in the FinTwit world, Trey the Dante. Okay. Are you familiar with that handle? No. Um, okay, so he, he was talking about a time when he worked in a, in a prop trading room in London. Okay. And um, there was one guy there who was the big hitter. He was a guy who made lots of money. This guy could have like multiple six figure days. And. There was one day where this guy, I knew this guy, had sort of bagged about three or four hundred thousand pounds. It'd been the best day ever right. for him. So, Trader Dante left at the end of the day. Um, his name is Tom, by the way. So, Tom left at the end of the day, went home, got to his house, realised he'd left his keys in the office. You know, so, and this was about seven, eight o'clock. Right. It was getting dark. So, he thought, I better go back to the office and get them. I got, got into my, my apartment. And he got back there, and there was one light on in the office, one left, a light left on in the room in the corner. And he didn't know who it was. And he went over and he had a closer look, and it was this guy who'd made all this money. And he's gone like, he's gone to him, he said, hey, dude, why aren't you out celebrating? Right. Why aren't you out, you, you know, sort of. Yeah. And he says, no, I made the day work, I always do it. He said, you always hear this time. I said, yeah, quite a lot, especially when it's a big day. You know, I have to sit there, I have to analyze, I have to go through everything. And that is the hard yards of trading. Yeah. You know, this guy wasn't going out celebrating and, you know, down in bottles of Don Perignon. Right. You know, he was analyzing as if he'd had a normal day or a bad day. Right. And that is what great traders do. You know, it's, it, it's, and that is what they all do. They don't tell you, they just do it because it becomes natural to them. Yeah. That's what people don't realise the hard yards of trading, the unsexy stuff is that stuff that you have to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, when uh, when you spoke to us earlier, you talked about the urgent versus the not urgent, right? This is the not urgent stuff, but it's the more important yeah. stuff in the long run. Because I'm sure he felt that trader you were using example. I'm willing to say, like, the only reason I had this good day is because I do this work afterwards. Yeah. Right. That's how I got here. Stuff. Yeah. The not sexy stuff is the important, not urgent. We put all our energy into what the urgent stuff is, and we think the, the urgent stuff is. Right. And actually, you know, you have to do that. You're fighting fires, you, the market, you're following the market all the time, you're looking for opportunities, you're scanning it. So, you know, you're reading research. So that's kind of obvious. Yeah. But if you're not practicing that out, we're doing the important but not the urgent stuff, you're not growing because all the growth happens, yeah. all the improvement happens doing that stuff there. Yeah. You know, it's, again, it's the hard yards. It's the not sexy stuff. It's the you know, it's the guy who runs the car with the makes it easy. It's because he's done all that stuff. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more and, and fascinating conversation. So we, we definitely need to focus on the not sexy stuff because it's what makes it all work. I wanted to slip something in because I thought it was fascinating on your website. If I give it a plug for it, the alpha R cubed, there's some great material on there. And one of the things you had posted was, uh, I assume you developed over the course of your trading, your golden trading guidelines. And um, I thought that was fascinating because they weren't 
weren't like they weren't trading strategies. They were more, you know, what do I need to pay attention to? What do I need to think about? Or you know, how do I position myself mentally and and to to to, to be in the right place for trading? And and one of the thoughts you had in there was about confirmation. And if I could quote yourself back to you, you said confirmation is one of the great paradoxes of trading. If you wait for confirmation as the theory demands, then by the time you get the opportunity, it's largely done or the risk and reward is significantly diminished. However, if you anticipate it, it may never happen and often doesn't. There's no easy answer to this dilemma. This is the art of trading. And I loved that statement because it was it, it you really caused me to think and say you're right. Like we talk about setting up a system and managing your risk and all this stuff, and and people never know like when when do I pull the trigger? How do I know when to put all this stuff into action? And to me, that statement sort of brought it together to say you're right. There, there's a significant art in this where you have to find your comfort zone. When is enough confirmation enough that you can? exercise your risk parameters against a strategy that you're comfortable trading, uh, but not having waited so long that you've missed that opportunity and caused more, more stress on yourself because now you've taken a poor entry or, you know, you sort of, you sort of missed that, that opportunity and your risk reward is now off. Um, and like you say, that, that's the art that there's no easy answer. If, if I had, if I had the golden answer to that, then frankly, you could probably just program a computer to do it. And, and, you know, then I could sit at home and never have to, you know, <laughs> call up the screens. Yeah. But, but yeah. it's not. I mean, there's a reason why I think that you know, so far our AI systems and, and artificial intelligence and computers haven't taken over because there is a significant art to the trading and finding those sweet spots, and that's that's what we all have to figure out. But intuition is part of it. You hmm. can't not use intuition. It comes in somewhere, even in the building. If you have a fully systematic process, the, the intuition comes in the building of the system. Right. It also comes in the improvement and the calibration of the system. You know, you, you all starts with a feeling. Right. Everything starts with a feeling. Your intuition starts with that. You talk to every great trader, and they'll tell you that best trade started somewhere with a feeling, an impulse, an intuition. And, and, and intuition and, and developing that is as, is as important as it is developing the analytical side of it, if not more so, because it's where your edge resides. Right. It's where you're going to get yourself. Do you remember trading is not just about making money, it's also about keeping the money. <laughs> so it's, True. You know, you, you're going to make wrong calls and bad calls, and it's about making sure you exit those without bankrupting yourself or undermining yourself or killing yourself or just, just doing too much damage. Right. So it, it is so important and part of your process is to learn to hone your intuition and a part of it is also to maintain it. Mm. So if you were to think of um, as if you had a kind of a giant radar on your head. Right. Uh, you know, maybe a couple of antenna. You know, you're always sensing the market. You're always scanning the market. You know, your feelers are out there all the time, and they're always being used. And, and you have the option, actually, of keeping them, um, keeping them upright and alert and clean and working well, or you have the option of undermining them so they're turned off and, and damaged. And, and, and when that happens, your intuition is going to be compromised. You know, when you're trading through fear. When you're on tilt, you know, your intuition is going to be very, very severely impacted. Yeah. And when you're fully present, when you're in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a healthy state of mind, your intuition is going to be much sharper. And, and you do have the choices of keeping yourself and putting yourself, managing yourself so you're in those states. And when you're in a healthy state, when you're in a healthy mindset, it's far easier to make that leap to great performance. You know, it's what you would call being in the zone, in the moment, you know, where actually you make those decisions. So those decisions are almost for a few fifty, you know, where, where you haven't quite got confirmation bias, if you've got confirmation bias, or you haven't got quite got confirmation, and then you want, just want to get ahead of it. And I, I'll tell you a story about a guy I worked with a couple of years ago. Have really highlighted about this idea of sensing and intuition. So this was a, a trader in a bank 
right. working on the FX test. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I asked him how to trade, to process, etc. And he said, I trade currencies, uh, G10 currencies, the main currencies. And what I do is I arbitrage them. So I, this was in 2016. Right. And I'm, I'm thinking in my head, no one has arbitraged foreign exchange currencies since about the 1990s. <laughs> because computers made it impossible. You know, you've got a very, very fixed relationship. Say if you've got three currencies, it's a triangle. Right. You know, one moves, and the other one moves, the third one has to move because it's a, it's a constituent of the other two. And there is no room for human skill to sort of catch misalignments. Um, you know, a computer can do it in a, in a, in a billionth of a second right. or less. So there's no way that you can do that. And yet 20 years later, he's telling me that he's doing that and he's the most successful trader in this team because everyone's telling me about him. And that's his method, basically. He's arbitraging currency, which is... Uh, <laughs> I've like spilled this further. It's like, I don't understand more about it. Is he really doing this? How's he doing this? And then you realise that He's, he's using his intuition to do it. And what he's really doing is he's, it's the method he's evolved. He will watch all three currencies. He will see behaviors affecting one of the currencies. Then he'll see that in a second currency. And he knows he can hit those two currencies and just leave the other currency for a minute or two. Now he could have done it in another way, but he always does it that way because that's his method. Right. So he was literally arbitrary. Well, he wasn't arbitrary because it was impossible, but he was using intuition that sounded like arbitrage. It seemed like arbitrage, and he stuck to that method. Right. Right. The method he came from because he was taught from somebody else who did that in Singapore and helped him refine and hone that method. So it's pure intuition. It's pure recognizing patterns in the relationship between the currencies that would give him an idea or a signal that something was going to happen and it was an opportunity really quickly to get in and out. And it was brilliant. And it be, uh, computers can't do that. Right. Maybe they can. Maybe AI can do it. I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I have some guys I know who use AI and they use it brilliantly on day trading. And maybe they are doing something like that. You know, or well, maybe they, what? that's coming further along. Maybe that's down the line. Pattern recognition that they can do. But I don't think there's anything like the human mind yet with that capability or even remotely close to it. And he probably couldn't even tell you exactly what the patterns were that he was correlating, right? Like you said, it was intuition, which I've always believed that intuition is sort of the um, is is the the innate ability of the human mind to put seemingly unrelated data sets together and come out with with an outcome. So you know you, you can you can seem more intuitive um, with more experience because you know you, you get sort of that data and your mind will process and you probably can't articulate articulate exactly um, you know what you've assessed you know you ask somebody so how did you know You're like I don't know I just knew well you know that's probably a combination of experience and intelligence and applied learning where they've you know just sort of figured out I, I, I know what to do because I don't think anybody is born a natural you know intuitive currency trader <laughs> like no, right so, so, so this is a this is a topic we've got guests coming on the podcast soon right arrange the date for the podcast we've agreed to do it um you might have heard of him his name's gary klein oh yes yeah dr gary klein so he's going to be coming on and he, he's written and studied intuition um for decades so he's, he's written some great books he's studied firefighters and he studied air force pilots and you know he studied people in the military and then in, in, in roles and jobs where people's lives are on the line and people make and that they were studying decision making right how do people make decisions in those heat of the moment situations and, and, and all the literature until then has been along the lines of you know we almost have this decision tree process going on and if A doesn't work, we then reduce to the next choice and the next choice. And, and he's found that that's not how the mind works. The mind brings together all the experience, and in the heat of the moment, all that experience comes together to make a choice. Right. It chooses the best path. So, for example, he was he was interviewing at the very beginning of this process when he was starting on a project that they were uh, commissioned to run. They were interviewing firefighters. And up to that point, they'd assumed that 
a firefighter makes a decision on, a, on like we say, a step-by-step -step process. Right. And they went to interview firefighters to confirm that that was how they, you know, that their, their theory on decision making conformed to that. What they found was actually it doesn't conform to that at all. At no time were these firefighters doing that. And what they were doing is they were just making a constant assessment of the situation the whole time and calibrating their choices. Hmm. And obviously, the more experienced they were, the more scenarios they had to draw on right. to make right. those choices. So he, he talked about a time where he was interviewing this head of a team, a fire team, and they were, they were doing a house fire. Um, they were, and it seemed like a regular house fire. So they were in it, trying to find it, put it out. And then for some reason, this firefighter, the head of the team, just had a really bad feeling and he didn't know why. Right. Yeah. And he just went everyone out and he ordered everyone out. And literally as the moment as the last guy, his foot left the room that they were in, the floor of the room collapsed in. Which there was no sign that that was going to happen. Right. And he said, you know, it would have been a disaster. And then they carried on fire the fighter. And they wanted to know where that came from. You know, and and he just said, I just felt it. Yeah, you just, for, I, I didn't know why. Things weren't adding up. Yeah. You know, there was disconnects going on all over the place. And it just didn't feel right. And I didn't know what was the right thing to do, but I knew we had to help get ahead out of there that moment. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that is kind of intuitive thinking. That's what people do. Yeah. You know, and, and there's, a, there's a great book called Sense Making by a Danish, uh, I can't remember his name now. And I, I talk about sense making in some of the models I do. That sense making comes from intuition. It's where you get this feeling. Yeah. You know, the, the more experienced you are, you get a certain feeling. And then you try to make sense of that feeling. You, know, you don't always act on intuition because intuition can mis mislead as well. Yeah. You know, it's kind of where the art of a good trader is. Yep. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's knowing when to use intuition and how to use it. And then this book talks about the next stage after intuition is sense making. It's that ability to make sense of what you're feeling and what you're noticing. Right. You know, and, and then to then build upon that, to conceptualize that into a plan and a strategy. Right. And you can do that sometimes in milliseconds, sometimes it can be done over weeks and months. Um, and he was talking in this book about George Soros. And, you know, you're probably familiar with the train to the century, yeah. which was he took on the Bank of England and just crushed them. Right. Um, and it, he goes through this, this trade in the book. And, you know, he said that it started with a feeling or, or a disconnect that, that Soros had. But he then started exploring and he started thinking, you know, and then started following all the data and following the meetings and the language and things like that. And that, he started getting this idea that, you know, this, this seems to be some idea, this seems a great risk of all opportunity here. You know, hell, if we're wrong, we're not going to lose an awful lot of money, but if we're right, we've got to slam down. And, and, and that's how that trade came around. Right. Which became the trade of the century. You know, and, and a lot of great traders I, I, I work with, and this is the beauty of what I do, because I now have access to the, the, the minds of so many great risk takers. I find so many of them do that. They follow that process wow. to find value. Wow, you know, I mean, you kind of work out for what yeah and it's uh it, it, like you said it's it's amazing because you know it, it, it's hard to articulate it's hard to always put in words but again that's where people put the assessment together uh, you know it's fascinating we could we could talk all day but uh um probably should uh should should cut it short so you mentioned your podcast i think if people want to visit your podcast it's alpha-mind.net I understand. That, that's yeah, that's the website. But just 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 Google Alpha Mind podcast. It's on iTunes. Great. It's on Spotify. Um, it's uh, it, it's on all the main ones. And the Buzzsprout is the system I use. Um, so you can go to Buzzsprout as well. Great. Um, and then we have a blog called the Alpha Mind blog. Um, where I put regular articles in, and I I think that's where you probably found that Golden Guidelines. Maybe I'm wrong. I didn't think it was on my 
my website, my, my, my website is Avro Cute. Yeah. Com, so that's the company I do the coaching for. You, you did have it right there on, uh, on alphaRcube.com. So, yeah. I, I, I'm out of touch with that. <laughs> <laughs> I found some good stuff in there. So I encourage everybody. And if, uh, and to your recommendation, you know, coaching is absolutely beneficial. Some, sometimes we can diminish the value of coaching, but as you say, a lot of the stuff is hard to do yourself, uh, to determine the root cause of your own behaviors is, is difficult because you are within your own system by definition. Um, uh, sometimes it's, it's always good to have an external perspective to help you sort of make sense of what you're doing and, and help drive improvement. So, yeah, as I always say, sports people do it, so, yeah. you know, and trading is a performance art. You know, so, and, and, and if you invest in coaching, the time, the money, the energy, you know, the payoff is, is just a massive call option. Sure. We call it, we call it performance improvement call option. <laughs> the, the call option, it's indeed. Like, it's only upside. It's, 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 you could think of it as a cost or you could think of it as an investment. Right. And that's why I always tell people, look at it like it's an investment. It's an investment in yourself. And it will pay off many times over many years. Uh. Agreed. I, I've done coaching from an executive side when I was an executive in, in large multinational companies. And I'll admit, I was skeptical going into it. Uh, you know, I don't need the shrink to tell me what's going on or somebody external, but the huge value. And to your point, you don't always realize it right away, but that insight is stuff that over time, I, you know, as I processed it, I realized, you know what, th th there's things I need to pay attention to. And if you get a good coach, it, it worth their weight in gold. So, so a great recommendation in that. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. It's uh, it, it's been a fascinating conversation, as I said, and uh, and I love talking to you. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I will. Thank you. I'd like to thank Stephen for spending time with us today. Fantastic conversation and some great food for thought. We really all need to consider coaching as part of our trading journey. Um, it's a cost, but it's an investment and one that absolutely pays off. If you're interested in following up with Stephen Goldstein, uh, with him or his team about coaching, he can be reached at alphaRcubed.com. Uh, so that's alphaRcubed.com. Or you can find his podcasts using Alpha Mind in any of your podcast provider. Some great material in there as well. Thanks again. Trade safe. Have a great day.